Welcome everybody to the 2022 Virtual Summer School Series Pipeline to Promotion. We're excited that you have joined us this week. I'm Diane Mashburn, Extension Instructor at the University of Arkansas System Division of Agriculture. Virtual Summer School is co-hosted annually. We're actually on our eighth session of Virtual Summer School. It's held by Southern Region Program Leaders Network Program and Staff Development Committee and the National Association of Extension Program and Staff Development Professionals. Thank you to all those who have contributed to planning this important and timely series. Today's session, starting on the right foot, recruiting, hiring, and I'm excited to introduce today's speaker. Dr. Kimberly LeCompte is the Associate Director of Human Resources with the University of Missouri. She currently serves in that position, providing HR leadership and expertise to faculty and staff within MU Extension and the College of Agriculture, Food and Natural Resources. Prior to joining MU, she specialized in academic employment policies and processes at the Louisiana State University and served as HR manager overseeing the HR function at LSU Eunice. She holds a PhD in educational leadership and research with a focus in higher education administration from LSU. We also have two co-facilitators assisting us today with our Q&A. We have Cheryl Newberry with Oklahoma State Extension and Nancy Calix with Kentucky State University. Thank you to everybody. And with that, I'm gonna pass things over to Kim. Thank you, Diane. And thank you so much for having me. Um, I'm gonna get my slides up here. All right, well, I really wanted to talk about recruiting and hiring today. And there really is, a lot to talk about. So I'm going to go over a very high, broad overview of recruiting and hiring ideas that you could possibly implement in your areas. Um, but there are tons of other ideas and details that I will not be able to dig into today. So um, please, any questions, um, let me know at the end. Um, so really, we have gone through some unprecedented times with the pandemic. Um, and so the pandemic has really changed how we approach recruiting and hiring, um, or at least it has employers rethinking how we uh, recruit and hire for positions. So before pre-pandemic times, the expectations of job candidates were very, very different from what they are today. Um, back then, it seemed like employers had uh, were in a position of power in the recruiting and hiring process where we had very robust candidate pools. I'm talking 20 to 40 applications for a position, many qualified candidates. Um, and we had the luxury of attracting, uh, we had very little difficulty um, with recruiting our top candidate um, that was chosen for a position. Um, so for those of you in higher education, uh, our recruiting and hiring processes are normally slower than that in private industry, but even despite um, that process being slow, we never seem to have issues with um, finding an equally qualified candidate in the pool that was available and very excited to take the role. And so you fast forward to today, and it's not the case. So now it seems like as an employer, the candidate now has the position of power in the recruiting and hiring process. Um, our candidate pools, at least from what I'm seeing from uh, the HR perspective, is that they're unusually low for positions that used to have 40 applications. Now we're only getting maybe 10. And out of those 10, there may be only a handful of candidates that are even qualified. And then by the time we get to the um, point of offering a position, that top candidate has either found another position and moved on, or um, they have multiple offers, which makes it even more difficult, uh, especially when budget is tight. Um, and we can't offer the compensation that we want to offer. Um, so for public institutions, of course, this makes it even harder to compete and keep up with changes in the market. So we as employers can no longer afford to maintain slow recruiting and hiring processes. And um, even though we may have tried to streamline those processes in response to the great resignation, um, it's not enough. And so that's really what I wanna focus on today. 
So I want to talk about what exactly is the employee experience. What do I mean by that? So Gallup um, defines the employee's ex experience as the journey an employee takes with your organization. It includes every interaction that happens along the employee life cycle, um, plus the experiences that involve an employee's role, workspace, manager, and well-being. And the reason why this is so important um, to focus on, to have this holistic view is because there's research out there that shows that organizations that have created positive employee experiences over the course of this whole life cycle are actually 1.3 times more likely to outperform their peers. And in a response to the pandemic, this is really what employees are looking for. They are looking for an exceptional employee experience, and they no longer want to work for an employer who can't deliver that employee experience. So um, over the next uh, hour or so, I want to focus on um, attracting, recruiting, and onboarding as this uh, encompasses the recruiting and hiring process. I'm not going to go too much into onboarding, but I just wanted to touch in, into it just because um, attracting and recruiting and hiring feeds into that onboarding process. And so with that, I want to talk first about attracting talent. Um, and this really starts before you even post the position, before you even interact with a candidate. And so one way to attract talent is to widen your net. And so what do I mean about that by that? Um, so first I wanna talk with the job, descri job description because before you post anything, um, you really need to look at that job description and that really provides a foundation for um, the rest of the employee experience. And you're setting up those expectations for what that employee um, is expected to do in the role. And so I just wanted to briefly um, ask everyone, how often does your organization review and revise job descriptions? I'm just curious. All right, so it looks like the majority um, update job descriptions when it's time to fill the job. Now I would recommend, and I will say first that that's sort of the, uh, that's the current practice here at university, at the University of Missouri. Um, at LSU, it was any time the position changed is when the position was updated, the job description was updated. Um, and for those of you who responded, we need to update job descriptions as a question, I would highly encourage you to start uh, reviewing your job descriptions more often, because like I mentioned, this really creates the basis or the foundation of that person's position and um, you're setting up those expectations. Um, the more that the employer and the employee are on the same page in terms of what their role is within, um, not with only within your unit, but within the larger scope of the organization, um, the better experience you as a supervisor are going to have and the better experience your employee is going to have um, in, that, in that role. Um, and uh, so I, I would encourage a position is updated anytime the roles or the responsibilities significantly change. Um, and so if you only update that job description when the position is posted um, or needs to be recruited for, you could have employees that have been in that position for 15, 20 years. And so I would imagine that that position would have evolved significantly over that amount of time. And so instead of um, spending a, a lot of time and effort updating that job description, trying to think back, okay, how has this position really evolved over 20 years? If you update it more frequently, it'll become a lot more, um, it'll be easier to update and you won't be spending a whole lot of time on it. Thank you for sharing. So as I mentioned, start with the job description. Um, are all the components there? Is there a title? Is there a description summary? A brief paragraph that tells you how that position fits um, within the team and how they might interact with the larger organization and stakeholders. Um, do you have a salary range there? Uh, so I've been reading a lot of articles that um, have suggested that employees really wanna see uh, a salary range because that could really weed out a lot of candidates that may not they, their expectations may be higher than what maybe we can offer. Um, that could be useful information to them. Um, do you have all of the essential functions included? Uh, and I would encourage that you focus only on those essential functions um, that are required for that specific role. 
So try not to get lost in the weeds and try to keep the job descriptions um, relatively concise because if you provide a very long descriptive job description, um, candidates are going to see that and they're not going to want to apply because that's just too much time to read. Um, so try to keep it very high level summary but also provide enough detail that they know what they're getting into. I have seen uh, two sentence job descriptions um, and job advertisements, and that's not very informative either. And then I would encourage you to review and revise the position qualifications. Um, so for example, over time for an entry level position um, that maybe at the very beginning 10 years ago may have only required a high school diploma and maybe two years of experience. But then as you get um, candidates in the role that have really rocked it and they have uh, maybe a bachelor's degree and maybe they have six years of experience, we tend to want to advertise and attract the people that you're trying to replace. And so your candidates for an entry level position, they're not going to have a bachelor's degree and six year, years of experience. Um, and so we might not be able to find someone that exactly fits that mold. Uh, so try to revise them back to the actual basis of uh, what that minimum qualifications were before. Um, and again, you want to, you don't want, to my point in the um, picture, you know, starting starting him off early um, so he can get his 20 years of experience and you don't want to require um, 20 years of experience for a position that really someone could come into and really learn and um, run with the role and be great at it with zero years of experience. Um, so you're already limiting your candidate pool just by those minimum qualifications and don't do that. I would say you could offer that in preferred qualifications um, if you're looking for something very specific, but for the most part, uh, look for candidates that um, may have the drive uh, and the motivation and um, the desire to learn. Uh, look for those positions, those candidates, rather than um, sticking to do they have six years of experience. Um, another way that you can attract candidates is by developing an employee value proposition. Um, and so an employee, employee value proposition is the value an organization offers to employees in return for the value that they bring to the organization. Um, and so I wanted to give an example of this because I think in higher education, we don't do a good enough job of um, selling ourselves and saying, as an employee, this is what you get from us. Um, so for the Price Waterhouse Coopers Careers page, I'm not going to read this whole thing, but the, as a potential candidate, if I were a potential candidate, I highlighted the words that, that stuck out to me that I thought as a candidate I might be attracted to. So training, support, development, my career is important to me, um, diversity, and then are you ready to make an impact? And so as a potential candidate, I'm going to look at this and say, yeah, I want all those things in, in an employer. Um, they really care about developing me as an employee and making sure that it includes diverse backgrounds. And um, yeah, I'm ready to make an impact. I do want to make an impact. Um, and as I mentioned, higher education institutions, I don't think we do a good enough job of selling ourselves. Um, and really highlighting what we can do. I think that we have, we do great with mission and vision, um, with saying what we can do for others um, in terms of the stakeholders that we serve, but in terms of attracting employees, I think we need to do better at saying, this is what we can do for you as an employee if you serve us to help support this mission. And so the Another example of an employee value proposition, this is um, one that I found from Northwestern Health Services University, and every other EVP that I found from higher ed was significantly longer than this. So I suggest that you don't, <laughs> don't make it long, make it two or three sentences, keep it very short and succinct um, so that you can include that on recruiting and hiring materials. Um, and so I don't want to spend too much time on this, but just wanted to offer this as an example of um, don't go too much longer than this. Um, so 
if you can, I would say reconsider compensation if possible. Um, so 23% of organizations, according to SHRM, plan to increase their pay. Um, there was a recent survey uh, on, I believe it was LinkedIn um, for 2022, or was it Indeed? But in any case, the, the survey showed that um, only 24% of employees left their job due to conf uh, compensation after COVID. That's 24%. So that means that 76% of employees actually left because of something else. So I would say here that, yeah, in higher education, we tend to pay lower than private industry. So if you can reconsider compensation, that's great. But that's not why employees are leaving. Um, that, that is certainly not why they are leaving. It's not the only reason. The majority of um, research has shown that uh, employees, over 90% of employees during COVID um, reevaluated why they were in the role. They reevaluated what their passion is, and they decided that it was time that they go after that passion in their role. Um, they also were looking for more flexibility. Over 90% were looking for more flexible work environments, not just remote work, but flexible, um, maybe hybrid. Flexible is not just 100% remote. It's being flexible in the hours um, and understanding that life happens and we need to adjust for that. Um, also to widen your net, look for hidden talent. Um, so I remember, oh, back when I first started in HR that uh, my very first interview process we looked, we had a pretty robust candidate pool, but there were several um, candidates that had a gap in their employment. And immediately um, we just dismissed those applications because of that gap. It, we've been taught that that gap raises red flags. Um, I would say don't discount those candidates. It's not a red flag. Um, use the, if they are qualified and they meet the expectations and they their resume shows that they have the experience, invite them to an interview and just get an understanding of what that gap is. Um, that's something that you can explore in that structured interview. And maybe there it was a life reason, or maybe they took some time off to go to school. Whatever it may be, um, it shouldn't disqualify them, at least from having that conversation. Um, and also you can look for other pipelines. So for MU Extension here, we're looking um, to high schools and um, other colleges across the state. Uh, to look for programs that might align um, with our positions to build a pipeline and build a partnership. Um, so reach out to local communities, to um, local schools uh, to build those partnerships and maybe you can build a pipeline um, between them. And then for your employees, I would say focus on work-life balance and flexibility if you're able. Um, so 78% of employers provided remote work options. Um, again, this wasn't 100% remote work, but it was just remote work options. Um, and so that is something that you can certainly work with your institution or your HR professional um, to look into if you're not sure if you have those options. Um, all right, so I'm just curious, that brings me to my next question. Does your organization have a formal remote or hybrid work policy? So we still have quite people chiming in, but it looks like it's kind of all over the board, Kim, and responses there. So we do have some that do. Interesting. Handful that don't, and then okay. handful are not quite sure. Probably going to okay. have to go, they're going to want to go check after this, you know that. Yeah. <laughs> So for those who said no, um, I would encourage you to reach out to your HR professional um, to see if there's something that you could formalize. And the reason why I think it's good to formalize something um, is just because that way everyone is on the same page. You under, your supervisors and your employees understand the expectations of what that hybrid policy looks like, when to communicate, um, what sort of uh, expectations, um, need to be met during that time and have something documented is always best practice, especially when there could be disputes that arise. Um, there could be performance issues that come up. And so having that documentation to refer back to uh, is very helpful. 
So I wanted to talk a little bit about, if I can get my slides to advance, um, when to go remote or hybrid, um, because not every position um, lends itself well to that type of situation. So very briefly, I just wanted to say that the, tax, the tasks can be performed offsite and sent to and from the employee's home with ease, speed, and confidentiality, especially if you're working with confidential documents. You want to make sure that there's that secure connection. Um, it requires independent work and limited face-to-face -face interaction. So if you have someone who works with um, stakeholders in person on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, say you have uh, a county agent that works in a county office and they constantly have the community coming in and out of the office and they're interacting with them personally. That would not be a good work remote uh, position. You would want to keep that position um, in person. And the tasks, objectives, and work products are clearly defined and measurable. And then um, you want to make sure that the objectives have identifiable timeframes and checkpoints. Um, so make sure that you are always checking in with that employee to make sure that they have everything that they need, um, that the expectations on what they're working on are very clear and they understand deliverables. Um, if you can't monitor or you can't measure or evaluate their performance remotely, I would not suggest uh, moving forward with a remote work or a hybrid arrangement. Just because working remotely is hard enough as it is, managing remotely is even more challenging. Um, and then just make sure that technology can support the arrangement uh, and that there are minimal requirements for special equipment or access to materials or files located in the office. Um, so just trying to set them up for success at home. The key point for creating a position or having a position be remote or hybrid is that there should be no difference in performance um, from when they're working in the office to when they are working at home. Um, you should see no difference in performance at all. Um, and just some other strategies for attracting talent is to embrace social media. Um, so 83% of employers used or plan to use social media as a recruitment tool. And that was back in 2019. So of course, I mean, social media has just gotten bigger since then. So um, lean into LinkedIn. Talk to your HR offices about using LinkedIn talent. Um, they, they may have a subscription to it. And so LinkedIn talent allows um, institutions to uh, target and source candidates. Um, if you don't have access to LinkedIn talent, I use LinkedIn just to search, you know, hashtag extension. Um, and sometimes it'll bring up a list of um, folks who are in extension that are on LinkedIn. And I just started reaching out to those folks who might be interested in certain positions. Um, so there are certainly ways to get around um, not having to subscribe to additional uh, resources just for sourcing. Um, reach out to your network. So most often your network is going to be um, your your biggest resource for um, finding qualified candidates. But the thing is, is that you have to put in the effort to really drive that communication with your network. Um, so one thing you can do is develop extension specific materials um, that really highlights the, the um, essential responsibilities of the position, the in value employee value proposition, um, and then just what your extension unit is all about, and then share that within your network and get them to share it within their network. Um, so word of mouth is very powerful in recruiting. And then um, putting together a social media recruiting strategy, um, especially if you work with your HR professional on this, could really help as well. So uh, you can also use Facebook and Instagram and Twitter um, create an online presence if you don't already have one. Get your users involved and then, of course, personalize your approach. And now for recruiting. So that's just attracting the talent, getting them in and interested to actually apply. So when you're recruiting, this is when you have the application. And so now you're going to start going through the interview process. Um, 
And so just something I wanted to share is that uh, LinkedIn Talent Solutions reported that 20, there was a 20% increase in candidate drop-offs from the hiring process just in 2019. So that means that folks who thought the process was too slow or they had a bad experience, they just decided to withdraw their application altogether. So I would imagine that this 20% has grown since the pandemic. And then in another survey, 65% of candidates say that they had a bad interview experience that made them lose interest in the job. And this has happened to me as well personally. So I, I can say that, and I would encourage you to be thoughtful in how you um, structure and go through each step of the interview process um, and be mindful of what that person is experiencing so that you can create a very um, great first impression. And so um, some of the challenges of keeping candidates engaged during that process, and this, these are things that I've experienced myself and, and observed in my role. Um, the ac application process is lengthy and time consuming. And I understand that we may not have full control over this. I know there are certain uh, processes um, that I can't control here at MU. Um, communication to candidates does not provide clear next steps. So just be clear on exactly what you're expecting from that candidate at each step and let them know what they should expect from you during the process as well. Um, candidates aren't adequately prepared for interviews. This kind of goes back to that communication, making sure that it's clear um, and that they understand uh, the, the process from start to finish. Um, the decision-making process lacks a unified approach. So if you're um, working together with a search committee, uh, go through the competencies and the criteria for the position and have an agreement on what you're looking for in each candidate. Um, too often I've had search committees skip that step and so they're not on the same page for what kind of candidate they're looking for and then they can't come to a decision and they can't identify a clear candidate to make an offer. Um, so just make sure everyone is on the same page. Um, salary and benefit expectations weren't discussed up front. You can get go through a two-step process, um, interview process, and get to the end and find out that the salary that you have to offer is way below the salary expectations of the candidate. Um, so try to have those conversations up front. And then a bad reputation can raise some concerns. Um, so just keep that in mind as well. And so here are some suggested solutions. So if you can, streamline the application process as, as much as with it is within your control. Um, and be proactive in including timelines to candidates. Um, try to give them some sort of uh, guidelines, um, structure to what they should expect. Um, and if there's going to be a presentation, provide them with the necessary information that they need, uh, the topic that they should present, how long. Um, again, have the hiring committees align what the role should look like. Be upfront and clear about the compensation and benefits. And then be proactive learning about real and perceived issues. So I uh, had experience on a search committee where there were very clear morale issues um, within the department. And those things came up in the interview with the candidate that we weren't prepared for. And uh, it was not a bad, it was not a good impression. Um, and so just be mindful of those issues because if you're mindful and you understand some of those issues that are happening, you can be prepared to address it. And you can also intervene um, and try to direct that conversation in a different way or reframe it to challenges, not issues um, that that person may experience in their role. So you don't want to frighten the candidate. And then during the recruiting process, just be respectful. Um, some of this may seem like common sense, but I, I've seen, I've observed things too much um, to say that uh, I wish it were common sense, um, but just communicate with and thank candidates during each step of the process. Um, my general practice is uh, I email candidates that won't be interviewed. Um, I give a phone call to any candidate that was interviewed regardless of the hiring decision. Um, it's more personal that way. It's more respectful and the candidate appreciates that personal touch. 
And then give candidates your undivided attention during an interview. I have seen search committee members, uh, while a candidate is talking, get on their phone. They're clearly not engaged in the interview. They're not paying attention and it's disrespectful. So um, just be mindful, give them your undivided attention. And then try to notify candidates of the hiring decisions as soon as possible. Um, I know sometimes this can be difficult, especially in higher education when it can take weeks to get a search committee to make a decision. But just give them an update if you can. And I know that this is hard and it does take a lot of time and follow up, but try to be as consistent as you can. And then try to under, be understanding of their perspective and what they may be experiencing. So if there's lack of communication on our end to them, they might be making up their own stories in their own head on what's going on. Um, so just try to be transparent and stay open to giving and receiving feedback. Keep track of candidates that you might consider um, for future openings, especially if it's not, uh, if it's a candidate that um, you think would be great in another position, but maybe not this one. Keep track of them and ask them if they want to be considered for other positions. Um, so that way you're also creating a, a pipeline, so to speak, through your own recruiting efforts with an extension. There have been several candidates in my own experience here at MU Extension where um, they may not have fit one position, but there have been several other positions that I was like, oh, this person would be great here instead. Um, and so then I would reach out to the hiring committee and, um, and the candidate and try to align um, that person's qualifications and interests with the open positions that we have here. Um, especially if you have someone that really wants to be an extension and you notice that they have several applications in, um, we wanna keep them. We want to keep them interested in, in joining our team. And so that's one way to do that. And then um, be welcoming and don't rush the interview. Uh, Again, this seems like it could be common sense, but I, I've seen it happen. And I know sometimes we all get busy um, with our own, um, our own schedules and it can be easy to get caught up in that and need to get to the next meeting. Um, but if you schedule interviews back to back, I would highly recommend not doing it. Give yourself a little 10 to 15 minute break in between. So that way you're not rushing one interview and going to the next. Um, and, uh, and then you can give yourself just a little bit of breather. And then also to help um, streamline this process, there are ways that you can leverage information and technology. Um, so for example, virtual meeting platforms, um, using Zoom for first uh, round interviews really helps. Um, and then usually on-campus interviews happens around the second, uh, second interview. Um, but you can also leverage technology for appointment scheduling. Um, so in an uh, interview experience, I had uh, the recruiter used Calendly. And so they reached out to me and um, in the email, they had this Calendly link where I went in and I selected what interview time would be best for me. And as soon as I selected it, that meeting was already scheduled. It was automatic. So it removed two or three steps that that recruiter would have had to take to put the, um, create the Zoom interview and uh, create the meeting invitation and then email it to me and follow up. And like all of that was done automatically. So try to find ways to eliminate those um, really small steps that do create time. And so uh, that will open up, uh, just a little bit of time for you to focus on more higher level things um, like review of applications. Um, and then also use survey tools for collection of candidate feedback. So I use Qualtrics for gathering candidate evaluation um, feedback for various searches. And so this allows for a very streamlined, um, structured way so that discrimination, bias, any of that is removed from the evaluation. So I um, specifically look to um, talk about the person's strengths, the weaknesses, and then a recommendation. Um, so that helps to provide a very objective um, review rather than 
search committee members or other stakeholders sending back more in um, other types of feedback. Uh, for example, um, I had someone uh, send in an email feedback that said the candidate uh, was a great communicator, but they couldn't understand the language because they had an accent. So it's conflicting and very clear, it was very clear that there was some bias and discrimination happening in that feedback. But by providing these survey tools, you can eliminate that and just focus on the person's strengths and the and in the position and the essential functions of the role and the weaknesses. And so this leads me to my next question. So how do you or others in your organization collect feedback on your recruiting and hiring processes? So far, Kim, we've got a few people that use the applicant tracking system, candidate feedback surveys. We have somebody who says they do ask their candidates directly. That's and a lot awesome. Some people don't know. Yeah, that, that's okay. great to see that direct ask. But yeah, 76% so far say they, they don't know how it's collected. All right. Well, for those that do collect um, feedback through surveys um, or they ask them directly, uh, so the applicant tracking system really collects demographic information um, on applications, but really to understand what your candidates are experiencing as they go through these processes, I really rely on the feedback surveys and asking candidates directly. Um, so you can do a search just to find other candidate feedback surveys. Um, that you can send directly to your applicants just to understand what could we do better during this process? How can we make your experience better? And so by utilizing these tools to gather data and feedback, especially from the candidates that go through an interview process with you, you can understand your brand awareness a little better. Why are they applying? Are they applying because they want to work for MU Extension and, and your brand is very well known? Or is it the university itself or is it something else? How brand aware are they? Um, and just to get feedback on their recruitment experience, if you know that they saw something as inefficient or they experienced something that wasn't quite ideal, getting that feedback really helps you refine your own processes internally. Um, it also gives interviewer and manager feedback. So how well as someone who is interviewing a candidate, how well, what is your interaction with them and how can you improve that interaction? And then it also gives you an idea of the perceptions of company culture, which I think is very important. And then very briefly, I just wanted to run through onboarding. Um, so according to Gallup, only 12% of employees believe their organization does a good job of onboarding. So once you hire, you recruit that person and you offer them the job, that's a great, and say you've, you had a great first impression, you have to keep that going, keep that momentum going. Um, because kind of like buyer's remorse, employees tend to have remorse for changing jobs. Um, and so one of the things that you can do to avoid that or mitigate that is to implement pre-boarding strategies. So pre-boarding is starting the onboarding process between when the candidate accepts the offer um, and on their, in their first day on the job. And so this keeps new hires engaged and excited. It's an efficient way to process that paperwork, make sure they have a smooth transition and it provides an opportunity to welcome them. And then on the first day, just stay flexible, create an employee resource guide to help them become oriented to the university, and then provide a structured um, training schedule. What do they expect on day one, week one, month one, month three, and month six? Because onboarding really continues, could, it could continue up to a year after the person's first day. Um, so I asked how often your institution holds a formal new employee orientation. So it looks like, so our options are as needed once a week, once a month, or we don't have a formal new employee orientation. So unfortunately, we've got a couple that don't have a formal one. We have about a third right now, say once a month. A few say, one says once a week. And then about half, a little over half say as needed right now, still has some answers coming in. 
I know for, for us here in Arkansas, we do it every six months. So I guess that would fall under the, the as needed since it's a little bit more than once a month. But let's see what our folks say. Yeah, I think once a week is great if you can, if you have the time and the energy and the resources to do it. Um, and especially if you have a lot of new employees, um, I would say once a month would be uh, a little perfect. Um, as needed, that's also pretty great too, if you have the time and the resources. Um, but I do suggest, um, I, I do have folks here that uh, they don't know that we have um, a formal new employee orientation, both at the university level and at the extension level. Um, and so having that orientation is really critical to help that person become oriented um, and understand how they fit in the larger scope of the organization and just to understand what resources are out there available to help them in the role. Um, I'm not going to spend too long on organization orientation or department orientation, um, but really job orientation is going to happen uh, with any training that you've outlined in the onboarding training um, schedule uh, that I highly recommend that you develop just so they understand um, how how they be their specific role responsibilities and how they do those roles, how they perform their work. And another way that you can um, or help an employee become oriented to their job is to establish regular check-ins, make sure that they have all the resources that they need, um, and assign a colleague as a mentor. So don't take, don't put all of the training effort on yourself. Um, delegate that out, ask for help, reach out to a colleague and see if they would be willing to mentor that person. And so if you're not available, that new employee can go to that colleague um, for training and advice and any questions they might have. And then utilize a survey tool to gather data and feedback. So um, I've implemented a 30 and a 90 day onboarding survey at MU Extension. And so after the it's only been implemented for three months and already we're gathering feedback on how we might um, revise or um, improve our extension orientation and training program that we have available. Um, and so that's been really useful real-time feedback um, for our processes. And then I would just say, if you don't know what strategy to implement, I would ask your employees or your candidates. Um, so, I've provided very high level ideas and strategies here, but it may not be, um, they may not be useful if that's not what you need. Uh, so just ask, just find out what exactly your employees and your candidates are looking for in their experiences and then craft your employee experience around that. Um, and that that's really where I think that, that you all should start or maybe you have an idea, but there are little things that you can do um, uh, to help along the way. So with that, I just want to say thank you and let me know if you have any questions. Great. Thank you so much, Kim, for presenting today. And yes, we do have a few questions. So I'm going to let Nancy uh, pose those to you now. So we have one question uh, that uh, is saying, what are some suggested non-traditional places to post jobs for extension? Non-traditional. Um, so I wouldn't say they're non-traditional per se, um, but there are, and it, it really depends on how much resources you have, what budget you have for recruiting. So there are lots of um, journals, there are uh, um, higher ed jobs, the Chronicle of Higher Ed, um, networks, listservs, that um, I could certainly provide a list of some of the places that we've um, posted jobs before. Some of those cost money to do, um, but we, because budgets are limited and higher education, we tend to look for the, the free, <laughs> the free resources, right? Um, so I would say the bulk of the recruiting that we do is through networks. So we've created very specific um, job summary templates that have, um, it's branded for MEU extension. And so we email those out to our network and ask them to 
um, send those networks, have those networks share with their networks and so forth. Um, I post a lot of jobs on LinkedIn, uh, just on my own personal profile so my network can see it. Uh, any job fairs in your area, um, we've started to do that more, just back to basics recruiting, um, just getting out there in front of uh, at job fairs, high schools. Um, as I mentioned, uh, if you have any community colleges or other colleges in the area that you can partner with. Um, there's also uh, Missouri has, and I don't know if it's Missouri specific, but um, there is a program that helps place veterans in positions. It's sort of like a veteran internship program. Um, and so that's something that I wanted to look into as well is can we utilize that? Maybe there's there are veterans out there that have um, interest in our positions, but maybe they don't know what our positions are about. So just getting that information out in front of them would help us recruit as well. Um, and then Two, with the high schools, there might be teachers out there that are about to retire. And so they could become great program associates or, or um, education specialists out in the field um, that maybe they could continue in a part-time basis, uh, but they would also be a good resource. Thank you for that. We have another question that came and this is regarding uh, transferable skills. So specifically, what are your thoughts regarding this wave of potential recruits that are more focused on transferable skills that they could bring to the positions posted rather than actual content? And uh, this is within the context that some individuals are not, do not bring the content expertise, but are writing cover letters that explain these transferable skills. So what are your thoughts regarding this? So I think that if something can be learned that I wouldn't put as much emphasis on that as a qualifying criteria of the candidate um, than I would soft skills. So being able to communicate, being able to present, um, being able to interact and build those relationships, that I think, and having that drive and that motivation, um, that interest to grow in a position, um, I think is, the most important quality that you can hire for in a candidate. I think knowledge, skills, and abilities, yes, they are important, and yes, they are great um, to have uh, to start a position, but I think if, if someone can learn the content on the job um, and they are resourceful, then I think you could absolutely have um, a fantastic employee really grow and just take off in that position. And I think that you could be limiting your candidate pool if you're only focusing on the knowledge that someone has to bring. I, like I said, the knowledge I think can be helpful to have that person hit the ground running faster, but that doesn't necessarily mean that they're going to have the drive or the soft skills to be able to deliver that message. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So we have a couple more questions regarding recruitment. Um, to gather information from employees about what they would like to have had, had when onboarding, what do you recommend? Uh, and would you say focus groups, surveys, state interviews? Um, so I think it depends on your organization. So um, for us, survey fatigue is, is real. We have a lot of surveys um, out there. Uh, surveys definitely are the fastest, I think. Um, state interviews, I think, would be fantastic as well. Um, I think it also depends on how quickly you need the information. Um, so the onboarding surveys that I've created have provided real-time information so that we can uh, adjust our orientation and onboarding process rather quickly. Um, so at least in our case, I think the onboarding survey was the, the best um, way to go about that, but you can certainly do a focus group or a survey or um, the state interview, whichever might fit your specific situation. Mm -hmm. 
Okay, so um, many of the positions that are open in extension are now part-time without benefits. Any ideas on how to recruit? So that is a great question. Um, that So one of the reasons why um, we are also going to look at um, sourcing uh, retired, uh, uh, retired folks in education, whether it be at the high school level or community college, um, is because we could better utilize those part-time roles. And those, those, that population isn't going to want a full-time benefit eligible position, but they may want to continue um, teaching. They may want something to do in a part-time status. They may wanna keep contributing in some way. And so um, recruiting uh, for an extension part-time position might be that perfect fit for them. So that's something that we're looking into um, here. So I, I would say that would be my idea for the part-time um, positions is look for populations in your area um, that may not necessarily want the benefit eligible. So that would be your retired population. Um, uh, veterans might be one as well. Maybe they don't want to work full time or maybe they can't, but they still want that part-time role. Um, yeah, that's what I would start with. Thank you. Um, I know we're running a little uh, out of time, but uh, we will make sure that we get all the questions uh, that were an answer and we will get back to you. But right now, I believe that we need to go back to Diane so she can close us for this afternoon. Yes. Thank you again to Kim for presenting today. And yes, we are going to take those last questions that came in and present those, uh, give those to Kim. And so that'll give her opportunity to answer those questions as well as provide some of those um, resources that she mentioned as she was answering those previous questions. So we wanna thank all of you for attending today's session of our 2022 virtual summer school. If you'd like to contact today's presenter, her contact information will be shared in chat now. And we will be sharing her presentation on the NAE PSDP webinar archive page along with today's recording, that Q&A document I just mentioned, and all of that will be by the end of the week. Uh, we'd also appreciate your feedback on today's session, and there are a couple of ways you can access the survey. You can either follow the link we will be sharing in the chat, or by using your phone, you'll, you can scan the QR code that will be shown in the closing slides in just a second. And to close, we would invite you to come join us for tomorrow's session. Uh, we have presenters from the University of Tennessee Institute of Agriculture and Penn State University for their session on incorporating diversity from new hire to succession planning. You can visit the NAE PSDP website to register for this or any of the remaining sessions in this year's series. I wanna thank you again for joining us. Thank you to our speaker, Kim, and our facilitators and to everybody here in attendance. Have a wonderful day and we'll see you all tomorrow.